All right. Well, thanks, Lance. And again, um, thanks for everybody for joining us tonight. This is the fourth season of these February, March webinars, I guess, this year. Um, we're only going to do four of them, kind of kind of decrease the number over the years from eight down to six, now down to four. One reason is just, I think there's just fewer topics out there, but, um, but I, and I think, you know, people can only take so much of this as well. So Again, thanks for joining tonight. Uh, without you guys participating, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. So yeah, tonight we're gonna take a look at Viola. Um, Viola is one of those genera that I think, you know, everyone probably can identify the genus pretty well, but when you get into the nitty gritty of the species, uh, it can get a little bit difficult sometimes. So everyone recognizes these two species here I threw on the screen, hopefully the prairie violet here on the left and birdfoot violet up here on the right, a couple of our prairie species. And I should, of course, uh, as always, acknowledge the websites where I collect many, many photos. Um, all of these websites down here are locations where I, you're going to see photos come from. I don't identify every single photo uh, in the PowerPoint where it comes from. And if you want to know, I've got it. In another part of the pro, uh, another part of the PowerPoint, but uh, I don't put it up on the screen because it would just take so long and take up a lot of room. So we're going to start by taking a look at uh, just sort of a little bit of background on the Violaceae, of course, the family where Viola sits, and uh, this is um, a pretty cosmopolitan family. There's um, members of the family occur in every single continent except Antarctica, of course. It's primarily if you look at the uh, taxa in general, it's primarily tropical. Um, and most of the genera, uh, interesting enough, are either monotypic, meaning that they just have one species in the genus, or just a few. Um, and, and most of those genera are, again, in the tropics or subtropics. The exceptions are the ones, of course, that we run into, the genus Viola, which, as you can see, are the most abundant species um, in terms of the number of species, I should say. Well, world, uh, worldwide, again, there's 20, this should, should be 22 to 23, sorry, 22 to 23 genera. Um, there's always a little bit of uh, controversy, of course, in just how many there are. And um, 1,100 to 1,200 species worldwide. So it's a, it's a pretty moderately good sized family. But again, the bulk of those um, species are in the genus Viola, the 727 species. Rhinoria is a uh, tropical woody species, and you can see that's the second largest genus. And then Hybanthus, that's another one of the genera that we have in North America and also in Iowa. And that's the third highest. And if you look at really just those three first genera, uh, they account for about 98% of the species in the, in the family. So again, most of the other 20 other genera, you know, account for less than 2%. So they don't have very many species. Uh, most of them again are just single or a few species. Some of these characteristics here are, you know, general, general characteristics for the family in general. So uh, simple leaves, alternate, if they do have a stem, and again, that's gonna be important for Viola because some violets do and some violets don't. If they do have a stem, those leaves are alternate. If they don't have a stem, then the leaves are basal. Almost always have stipules and stipules can be pretty important in helping to identify which species of violet you have. And again, these are mainly Violaceae family characteristics, but these are also important characteristics for the genus Viola. Um, Flowers, bisexual, as it says there, meaning, of course, both sexes are present in each flower. And again, family-wise, uh, strongly bilateral. Uh, there are some genera that are just more slightly bilateral. And I think there might even be a few that are radial. But again, that bilateral uh, characteristic flower that we recognize in Viola is, is pretty common throughout the whole fa family. I've Tepals, five petals, those are all distinct. That means they're not fused to one another. There's no calyx tube or corolla tube uh, in, any, in any of these flowers. 
what's really the key, one of the key things about this family and unites all these different species and all these different genera is that next characteristic there, the, the stamens. Five stamens are connivant, forming a ring around the gynecium. Of course, the gynecium is the female part of the flower. Well, connivant means that the stamens come uh, in close contact with the gynecium, uh, converging on the gynecium, gynecium, but they're not fused to it. They're just, they just uh, are placed right next to it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll see that's, that's probably an important feature that uh, leads to the cleistogamous flowers that a lot, of a lot of violets have. Filaments are very, very short. They don't need to be very long because again, those anthers are, are placed right next to the gynecium, kind of right below the uh, style and stigma. The um, five, there's five stamens again and the lower two have a nectary. It's kind of like a little spur or outgrowth off the base of the filament. And that those two stamens again with this nectary those protrude down into the lower petal that has a nectar spur, and that's where nectar collects. Again, this is mainly a characteristic in viola, and, it's, and again, it's uh, less developed than some of the other uh, ge 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 genera. The uh, style is kind of characteristic, and we'll see some diagrams in just a little bit, but the style is kind of unique in the violaceae. Uh, and we'll just take a look at a picture of it in just a little bit here, but it's, it's um, got a very enlarged kind of uh, style that as it, as it goes up towards the tip of the style, it gets a little bit bigger, and then the stigma is very enlarged at the very top. So the violets have been around for a long time, um, by Lacey, I should say. Uh, molecular work that's been done places them back between 58 to 87 million years ago is when they uh, began to eri um, arise. There's a breakdown of the, again, the species in North America. We have just the two genera, Hybanthus and Viola. And then what the breakdown is in Iowa, again, using Eilers and Rosa, the checklist of uh, vascular plants in Iowa. Uh, 18 violets, one species of Hybanthus. There's at least six hybrids that have been uh, at least tentatively identified. But identifying hybrids is always a pretty tricky thing. So really who knows for sure there. And we'll talk more about that too. Now, so this is what's in Eilers and Rosa, 18 species of violet. And we'll be going to be looking at, you know, the newest nomenclature, of course, what's happened with four of North America. And it turns out there's been some changes, but there's still 18 species. And so what happened is, um, one species got dropped because it was no longer a valid name. It got um, really subsumed by another species. Uh, Viola uh, potincula is got subsumed into Viola nephrophila. So that one left, but then we got a new one, uh, Viola cuculata. Uh, it was added to the state's flora based on the flora of North America. And we'll talk more about that one too. Then there's three other species uh, incognita that got changed by synonymy to a different species. I mean, it's just one for one, so the count doesn't change, but Viola incognita is no longer recognized. It's Viola blanda. And we'll, you're going to see a table that shows all this. Viola raffinescuei is now bicolor, and Viola viarum is now palmata. But Viola is, again, a very successful genus. It's, it's primarily temperate. Um, as it says up here, the temperate species are mainly the perennial and annual herbs. Most of the tropical species are woody species. But the genus Viola uh, is very successful with 700 plus species, of course, worldwide. And violets occur mainly in the temperate regions again, but from uh, as far north as the coast of Greenland, where you can find Viola labradorica, the Labrador violet or alpine violet all the way down to the very southern coast and southeastern coast of Australia. And uh, from the sea level habitats up to subalpine habitats where Viola heteraceae occurs, which is the ivy-leafed violet. Well, violets again are gonna be our focus. So here's a quick diagram that just shows some of the morphology that's important with violets. So you have 
at least a little bit of help in um, again understanding some of the things we're we'll be talking about. Good. We, Good. Let me get my pointer here. Uh, let's see, there it is. So this first, so everything is labeled over here on the right, of course, all the diagrams are labeled so you know what you're looking at, but I'll just point out a few of these. The first one here, of course, is the entire um, shoot of Viola septembula. Uh, septembula is a southeastern North American species. This is an example of an acolescent. So acolescent and colescent are the two terms we're going to be learning more about. Acolescent means there is no above ground stem. The leaves are all basal, but it doesn't mean there's not a stem because the stem is right down here. Uh, in the acolescent violets, there is a, a short little thick stem. It's called a caudex, C-A-U-D-E-X. And uh, that's where the leaves then arise. The leaves arise all together from that caudex. And so they come from the, from the base of the plant. So I call them basal leaves. Then you got pictures of some flowers here. And then this is a nice long section of a flower. And here again, you can see things pretty well. Here is the gynecium right in here, the ovary with the ovules that will become seeds. The, this is the uh, style, kind of odd shaped style again. Well, actually this is, the, this is the pistil right down here, the ovary. And then this is the style right here. The style gets again, thicker as it goes up and then is capped by a very large stigma. So this whole thing is the gynecium style, stigma style and ovary down here. And that's what we see right in here. And then this shows the gynecium, the female part in through here, and then the andresium, the stamens, that again are right up next to it. They're located right up against it, as we said, connivant, that term we talked about. And so the short filaments and then the anthers right here, we can see two of them here. We can actually see a, another one behind right here because the two lower ones have these nectaries right here, these little short spur-like nectaries. If we can see them right here extending down into the nectar spur on the lower petal. So these nectaries will produce nectar and gets collected down here. Uh, this just shows one stamen right here by itself, one with the nectary. Here, of course, is the ovary and ovule is a long section. This is the stigma enlarged. This is a cross section through the ovary. Here's the fruit, which is a capsule. And here's the capsule splitting open. Uh, they split open to form three valves, basically. There's three carpels that form the pistil. <clears throat> and then when the capsule uh, splits apart, then we see those, those three carpels in, in a sense. And this is a seed right here. Number two up here is the is a Clystogamous flower of uh, the common blue violet, Viola soria. And then this right here is a floral diagram, which is kind of handy to again, help understand what's happening in the flower. Uh, this is the gynecium again in here, the female part of the flower is, is, is somewhat uh, triangular in shape. And that's, you can kind of see that sometimes in the capsules. And then the stamens right around here, these, uh, figure eights, if you will. Then these two again show the nectaries that come off of them. And then these are the five petals. You can see again, they're not the same size. Of course, this lower petal is, is larger and has a spur at the end of it. And then these are the sepals right here. Okay, so let's take a look at the difference between hybanthus Oh, challenges, that's right. First, first, we're gonna take a look at challenges to ID because there are some in the, in the violets. Again, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to recognize a violet, I think. Uh, once you've seen a few of them, that characteristic flower, we can see examples of here, um, pretty good gestalt on identifying it just on the basis of those flowers. But there are some challenges, challenges again, because when you get within the viola genus, then it gets a little bit more difficult to know for sure what species you're looking at. And that is partly due to hybridization. Hybridization is very common in the violets. More than a hundred named hybrids are known in the flora of North America. And they seem to be most numerous, those hybrids seem to be most numerous among the blue flowered acolescent species that are pretty common in Eastern North America. 
So when you have a hybrid, of course, what happens is you've got two species that make a mistake in terms of reproduction and are basically go through the mating process and pollination occurs and you get a resulting um, offspring that's a mixture of both of those species, of course. And that's, that's where it gets more difficult now <clears throat> because now you've got sort of a blend of two species. <clears throat> and of course, sometimes these hybrids, uh, another important part of the uh, violet evolution, of course, is hybridization has certainly been a factor in, this, in the speciation. Uh, no doubt many of the violet species that we have arose in the past through hy hybridization occurring and eventually that hybrid being able to become more successful than parents and, and get reproductive isolation, perhaps through um, polyploid hybridization, but somehow getting reproductively isolated from its parents and then becoming its own species then. So this can be, again, very confusing in terms of morphology. Another challenge that's difficult in terms of ID is that there's just a lot of phenotypic variation present in the, in the genus. The, uh, the size of leaves, the morphology of leaves and stems and, uh, usually increases, the, the size increases uh, through the growing season from early spring to late summer. The stems, the leaves and the flowers uh, vary a lot based on the environment that the plant is in, uh, environmental factors such as the, the slope aspect, amount of light, available soil moisture, other uh, soil variables, all can affect the morphology of those stems and leaves and, and flowers. This, that type of variation right there that's being influenced by the environment so strongly is probably largely due to acclimation. Acclimation is a response that organisms have to the environment that happens in their own life, lifetime, in their own lifespan. It, um, it's an adjustment. Uh, it's an adjustment in the phenotype that the organism can make in order to, again, be better suited to the environment that it finds itself in. Uh, again, acclimation is something that we are familiar with because when we go to um, a higher elevation, for example, if you go out to Colorado, spend some time out there up above 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 feet, you will gradually acclimate to an environment with lower levels of oxygen by your blood making more red blood cells. And that's so that your blood can carry more oxygen because there isn't as much oxygen dissolving into your blood because of the lower partial pressure. Well, again, that's an adjustment. That's an adjustment in our phenotype, physiological. Uh, what we see in the violets here and other plants a lot of times is acclimation that's morphological in terms of the leaves, but it can also be physiological. It can also be anatomical. Uh, I think a lot of the morphology in the leaves, again, the, change, the differences that we see in, in leaf morphology is probably due to this. And then there's also just some natural variation, of course, from one individual to another. There's always going to be some genetic variation that is just due to the um, unrelatedness between two different individual plants. All right, now we can go on to looking at uh, what's the difference between Hybanthus and Viola. Well, it's pretty easy to separate those two genera. It's hard to believe Hybanthus is really in the Violaceae in some ways. It doesn't look anything like a violet really, it's called green violet, of course, that's its common name, but it does again share some of those important features with the Andresium and Gynesium. And we can see that the capsules, this is a capsule of green violet, splits apart in the same kind of three carpelate way as the capsules of viola over here in viola sororia. But, you know, as you can see there, uh, there's some differences. The sepals are not auriculate, as they tend to be in the violets, uh, although the oracles can be um, very small and inconspicuous in some species, larger in others. An oracle is just a little ear-like appendage that comes off the base of the sepal. And uh, there's a lot of difference, of course, in the flowers. The flowers of Hybanthus are really not very showy at all. They're these uh, greenish white flowers, pretty small, as it, as it describes up there, 0.5 to five millimeters. Uh, whereas the violets are, are larger. The, um, 
hybanthus doesn't really have as well developed of a nectar spur as violets. It does have a little nectar pouch in a sense uh, where nectar collects, but it's not nearly as developed and as large as the nectar spur in, in violets. I think next we're gonna take a quick look at the table one in your handout, you, you get uh, this really big, nice table, which takes a whole lot of time to, to prepare, but uh, gives a good um, overview of the 18 species of violets uh, in Iowa. Before we start looking at those 18 species, it would be helpful to um, take a look at that table real quick. So that's what this is right here. I'll do a little bit of um, explanation of what's in this table if you haven't seen one of these before. So there's five columns as you can see here and they're labeled uh, across the top there. So the one that is sort of the base is actually the second one here because this is the nomenclature according to Eilers and Rosa. And of course, that's what we've got in Iowa for our checklist, Eilers and Rosa, as outdated as it is. It uh, badly needs to be updated, but that of course is a big job, so it hasn't gotten done yet. So this is what you will find in Eilers and Rosa uh, as far as the name goes, the scientific name and then some of the common names. And then this, I've also put into this column, um, the sort of a quick, um, it's a quick information about two important characteristics in the violets. Whether the species is coalescent, which again means it has an upright stem with leaves coming off the stem, alternate leaves, or if it's acoalescent, like this one down here, the A in front of coalescent means without stems, basically acoalescent means there are no, there is no upright uh, stem, it's just that short little caudex and it's got basal leaves. So that's a very important characteristic, of course. And then the other one is just the color of the corolla, the color of the flowers. Blue and white are the most common ones, but there's, you know, there's all, we also have a yellow one and we have uh, some others that are two or three colors. So that's what's in this column. Then flora of North America is over here. That's, so that's the current correct nomenclature if you're using flora of North America, what the scientific name is. And if there's, a, if there's varieties, a more, uh, two or more varieties, or what, excuse me, one or more varieties, then, and one of those varieties is in Iowa, then identify it here, uh, like Varieta dunca. Then just some information sort of about status, native species, what is Iowa coefficient of conservatism is, and this is the revised new uh, coefficients as of 2020 that was uh, finished up in 2020 by the floor of Iowa Working Group. So this will be, might not be the same as that, that original version that came out in 2000. So again, there's the coefficient and then there's uh, either an, an L for low, an M for medium or an H for high confidence assignment. So we assigned this confidence in terms of what we felt as a group, our confidence was in the accuracy of that coefficient. If the species is listed as either endangered, threatened, or special concern, then that's identified here. And if it is uh, listed species, then I've looked at the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory Database to see how many populations are have been discovered or known or mapped in Iowa and what was that last observation? When was that last observation? This is important because the last observation, 1991, means that, well, I mean, this has not been seen for a long, while, a long time. And of course, there was only one population for this species uh, up in the uh, northeast corner of Iowa on Algific Talus Slope. And the likelihood of that population being still present probably is pretty small. And so if um, the new listing of Iowa imperiled species hopefully will be coming out in 2024. John Pearson is working on that. I'm sure almost every day trying to get that done. Uh, the new listing is in parentheses here. So it was special concern back in 1990 when the list, the current list came out a long, long time ago. Um, it would be listed as endangered, but of course it probably is actually extricated when it comes down to it, but we don't know that for sure. All right, so that's, that's what's in these first two columns. And we got habitat over here. And the first habitat is usually what Eilers and Rosa says. So that's based on Iowa vouchers. 
And the other additional habitat information is coming from other sources like floor of North America or floor of Missouri or floor of Illinois, floor of Nebraska, other, other sources. Then the Iowa biogeography is a dot map based on one of three sources, the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory Database is this one right here, which is the best source of, of, of uh, data on where species are. Um, if there's no good map already done, then BONAP, uh, the Biota of North America program, uh, which is what these maps are, of course, over here that show the biogeography for the United States. I simply just take what you see right here and make it more visible and easy to see which counties uh, the species is recognized as far as BONAP's database goes. And this is all based on BONAP's database, which can be wrong. And it's not unusual for it to, to sometimes be wrong. Uh, then there's one more source and that's the uh, prairie plants of Iowa. If it's a prairie species like Pedato or Pedatifida, then Paul Christensen put a dot map together for the counties uh, published in Iowa prairie plants. And that's a better source than, than BONAP as far as what the native Iowa biogeography is. Again, what we're striving to show here is the native range, not the current extant range. That's pretty much what BONAP shows you, what the current extant range is. But it's more important from the standpoint of restoration and, and understanding the species ecology to know what its native range was. All right, so that's kind of what you're seeing here. Then all 18 species, as I said, are listed in here. This is a situation right here where, again, Viola Pertinkula was listed in Lyres and Rosa, but it's no longer an accepted name. It's a synonym now for Viola nephrophila. And Viola Paplanaceae was a synonym for Pertinkula. So those two were equated to be the same, uh, referring to the same species by Lyres and Rosa, but um, that's not the case anymore. Uh, Viola, what used to be called Viola Paplanaceae is now Viola saoria, common blue violet. And this is all based again on flora of North America, which by the way, is done by, um, primarily done by Landon McKinney. Landon McKinney is, has been um, one of the uh, foremost authorities on violets and Violaceae family probably as a whole over the years. Um, but there's at least three other um, I guess you might say scientists or scientific groups. Um, H. E. Ballard, who published some work in 1994, and N. L. Gil Gilad in 1997, and D. B. Ward in 2006. So there's there's these four sort of um, research groups that have been working on violets and violaceae over the years, and there are some uh, controversies and discrepancies uh, again from these folks too in terms of what they think the right nomenclature should be. But what we're looking at is what's in Florida of North America and that was done by Landon McKinney. All right, so um, here's another one that got its name changed, Rapinescui, it's no longer that, it's now bicolor, synonym for it over there. Um, and you can see there's a, there's a few species that are imperiled. Uh, so if we go, whoops, if we, um, let's see, it should be a couple up here, yeah. So let's take a look at that. So Adunka again is, is one that's imperiled. Um, Blanda uh, is gonna be, uh, probably come out as endangered. It currently is endangered. And here's one that's gonna go out go from special concern up to threatened, Lanceolata. Mikowski eye is going to be a threatened one. So there's four already. Uh, that might be, well, here's one more here, uh, Renifolia. So there's, this is five, it'll be threatened. Okay, then this one's going to take some explanation. So striata, uh, here's its, and there's probably a few more than this actually in Iowa that aren't, weren't known to me or uh, this, this one's not, it is in the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory Database, but there's probably some information has been put into it yet. So this has been thought, it was thought by others in Rosa to be a native species, but you can see, you know, Iowa is really on the edge of this range for it, certainly. 
And as this has gotten looked at more and more, and I've looked at it pretty closely in Polk County, the populations that we're seeing of this species are always in disturbed areas, usually. Um, I've seen them in cemeteries and lawns, uh, disturbed forests. This is its main normal uh, habitat in this part of its range. But um, so basically the Florida Bio Working Group made the decision that this is not native to Iowa. So it, it's, it's um, delisted, you might say. It's, it's certainly not going to be special concern anymore. It's going to be de delisted since it's not native. All right. So that's kind of a quick overview. Oh, one more explanation. So palmata, this is another one that has a, a synonymy name change. It's viarum in Isles and Rosa, but in Florida, North America, uh, viarum is a synonym for viola palmata, variety palmata. This one's a very difficult one to figure out what's going on because I'm not sure exactly what bone app is showing. Bone app, uh, this, this is the map that they say is for the, uh, viola viarum, but they recognize that as a hybrid. And so what you see on this map is the black dots are what Bonap shows. The red dots are what I found when I looked at herbaria vouchers, both at Iowa State and also at the, um, the um, Consortium of Midwest Herbaria website. I looked through all the vouchers of either Viram or Palmeda, uh, Palmeda, and got locations. And so the red ones are those based on actual vouchers, which of course is the best. And then some of these are black and red. And that means of course, they, uh, they were both. Uh, there were vouchers that I found and, and they were also already recognized by Bonap as well, probably because they saw the same thing that I, I saw. But there are some of course that um, don't have vouchers that I can find anywhere. So I don't know what Bonap is using to say that um, Palmate has been found in Story County and Boone County, for example. This one is a difficult one because I think um, there's, again, it's one of these things where it's, it's probably has arisen through hybridization. And so um, are we, you know, when you, when you, are trying to identify uh, a specimen then, and it, is it really palmetto or is it a hybrid? And well, I'll show you a, a voucher that'll make this more clear in just a little bit. Here's the recognized, or these are the listed hybrids that are in Otters and Rosa, just to name a few. All right, so that's that. Uh, if you have some questions about that, just let me know. Let's see, now let's bring up this again. All right, so now we're gonna take a look at those 18 species and uh, try to help you uh, sort your way through those so you can learn to identify them, at least have a better handle on them. I use primarily the, well, the key that worked the best is the floor of Michigan. Floor of Michigan actually overlapped with Iowa violets more than the floor of Missouri or the floor of Nebraska. So if you had to use one key, Florida of Michigan would be better, and it's online. So what we're going to do is, is start with this really important characteristic again of whether the plants are acolescent, meaning that the leaves are all basal. The flowers then are on the scapes. A scape is a long, naked peduncle. It doesn't have any leaves on it. It's a, uh, it's a peduncle, meaning it's, a, it's the axis that supports the flowers, and the flowers are at the top of it. There's 12 of these species, and then versus whether the plants are coalescent, meaning again, they have an arrow stem uh, with alternate leaves. And then the, if that's the case, then the flowers are axillary. They come out of the axils of those leaves. Now, the tricky thing with the coalescent species, you have to understand, is that all of these still have basal leaves, generally. Basal leaves can still be present, as well as a stem. And quite often when the when the plant is younger or first establishing, uh, or maybe first or coming back up in the spring from it, its uh, rootstocks or the rhizome, that it may just have basal leaves for a while. And it may not have that, that aerial stem right away. So this makes it possible to confuse you know, species that will clearly be coalescent later on in the season um, with 
acolescent species early in the season. And you have to be a little bit careful with that then. So what we're gonna do here is um, start out with the smaller group, the coalescent group of six species. And now we're going to split those into two groups as you can see here by looking at the stipules. Um, the stipules are these paired appendages that are, occur at the base of a petiole, at the base of a leaf. They're always, they're always present as a pair. And again, again in the Violaceae, those, these stipules are present on every, every species and they are persistent. So the question here is whether these stipules are really deeply dissected, um, especially in the lower half, and are so large that they really almost look like leaves themselves. The stipules are essentially reduced, very, very small, reduced, modified leaves. But in this case, we're saying that they are so large that they almost look like a leaf them, themselves. Um, the sepals with a prominent oracle. Again, that's, and if we see some pictures. I'll try to point some of these things out. These are also annual species. And these over here are perennial. These again have stipules that are not deeply dissected. They might be entire, which means they don't really have anything going on along the edge. They might have a little teeth. Serrate means they have little saw-like teeth, or they might be a little bit fringed, meaning they have um, sort of a really thin little uh, teeth, a little bit more elongated teeth, look like a little fringe of hair, if you will, but they're bigger than hairs, but they're definitely not deeply dissected, and they're clearly much smaller than the leaves. So there's four species in that group. So what we're going to do is first tackle these two annual species. And we can separate them uh, right here using the Corollas. The upper two petals purple, the lower three petals yellowish white. That's tricolor uh, versus all the petals kind of a lavender or a whitish blue. That's viola bicolor. And here's some pictures. So tricolor is, is garden pansy or field pansy. It's not, it's not native. So it's a weed basically. And it's, it's, it probably is cultivated too, of course. So it's somewhat of a, a scope from an escape from cultivation, but you really don't see it very much. It doesn't seem to be naturalizing very strongly, um, but it's out there. And here again, we can see these really deeply low um, stipules right here. Versus bicolor. Here again is a good look. This is a nice one. This comes from the Flora of Missouri website. They often take leaves off of the plant and photograph them like this. You can see these are the two stipules. Look how large those stipules are. They're almost like another leaf basically and how deeply lobed they are. So that's again what we're seeing over here too. You can't quite see it quite as well because the leaf is on the plant. But really easy to separate these species uh, with those large uh, leaf-like stipules. And then again, this is the one you're going to see out in nature. Um, Sarah Nizzi and the, the blog that she's been doing with Xerxes and the help she's been providing at uh, Polk City Cemetery has talked a little bit about our discovery of uh, bicolor there after we were doing some burning in an area that was dominated by dogwoods and shrubs for quite a while. And we were really happy to see that this and several other prairie species actually had survived many years of shrub encroachment and, and shading. All right, so that takes care of these two species. Uh, so group A, again, are these four species that, again, are coalescent, but their stipules are not deeply dissected. We're going to take a look at those next, group A species right here. And we'll start with, again, so that's what it's saying at the top there is we're going to split them into two groups again based on those stipules. <clears throat> um, but mainly what we can use, as you can see, there are the petals. The stipules are somewhat um, different in terms of being mainly e uh, mostly entire or just with a very few small little teeth versus being more fringed. Um, the group on the right there is more fringed, but Really, again, uh, it's the petals that are the most useful in terms of what their colors are here. The, the white and the cream can be a little bit alike, of course, but um, then you can always look at those stipules. 
So now we're going to kind of change the format here and use a little more of a typical key structure to deal with these here on the left, the, the ones that have either yellow or white petals. And of course, we can use those, of course, to separate them as well. So the ones with yellow petals uh, and all this other stuff are going to come out to biolocanodensis, the, the yellow downy violet, and the ones that are, or excuse me, yeah, down here, I just looked at the wrong one, the ones that are white up here. They have a little bit of a yellow base though, uh, are vilocanodensis. And you can see there are some other things in here that you can use, but you know, why worry about those unless you have to? If you didn't have the flowers then you might be able to use these stipules, of course, uh, to help separate them because there is a little bit of difference. The stipules on vilocanodensis are more scarious and pale. Scarious means they're kind of clear and sort of membrane-like versus the stipules down here are more like actual leaves, uh, green and herbaceous. And they don't really have as much of a prolonged tapered tip as these do here. And we can take a look at uh, those. This is by Locanodensis, uh, the white violet, tall white violet. You can see again, quite often in all these showy violets and these chasmogamous flowers are these nectar guides. There's these markings we see down here and the, the lower petal and the lateral petals right here. Uh, so we'll see that on lots of them. Nectar guides don't really help that much in identifying which species you have. But here, here's those stipule, excuse me. Yeah, these, uh, these are the stipules. Very um, um, long tapering, sharp pointed tip, somewhat scary. So again, scary is kind of more the texture and the thickness. So scarus means it's going to be kind of thin and somewhat transparent versus the uh, stipules on violet pubescence, the yellow violet shown right here, look much more like leaves and they, their tip is a little bit more broadly rounded. But again, if you got the flowers, uh, no problem separating these two. By the way, the capsules on yellow violet can be very, very pubescent, very thickly pubescent like this right here or they could be glabrous. So, but if you see, uh, obviously a capsule that's very, very pubescent, then uh, that's gonna be a helpful clue. That yellow violet is what you're looking at. So that's uh, two of them. Then the other two that have more of a fringed um, stipule, this, the margin of the stipules are a little bit more fringed along the margins. Uh, and, and also have more of a cream or blue colored flower. Uh, we're going to separate those two right here. The ones that have the creamy white flowers and they, they've got, again, really nice fringed um, stipules. The spur is not elongated or curved in any way. That's going to be a violet strata. That's that uh, striped violet. That's the one, again, that is no longer considered native in, in Iowa versus um, the petals blue. Now, now again, uh, in the blue vines, you can have albinos, you can have some, sometimes blue flowers do show up white. So that can be a problem, one of those problems that's hard to deal with. But normally, again, they're gonna be blue. Um, these two have a fringe, but the sepals aren't ciliate uh, as much as they are in straight up here. This one again is, is a dunca. This is the one that's probably extirpated from the state. Uh, so, and here's pictures of them. This is, this is the fringing on the stipules of striata. So this is, you see those little fringes, fringe coming off the margin there. And that's what we're talking about there. And you know, it's sort of a cream white, off white. Um, so again, you could, I suppose, confuse striata back here with canadensis because they both are somewhat white, but look at canadensis. It also has, it's white on the inside of the corolla, but on the back side of the corolla, it's kind of a bluish white. And I, I make a point of that uh, purplish white on the outside right there. And again, this, this won't have uh, stipules that have the fringe that you see right here, these fringes here. The dunk again is, is really uh, probably not present anymore, but um, it has the bluish corollas and can't really see the stipules very good. I couldn't find a picture that showed them very well. But moving on, okay, the next group is group B, which all the rest of all the violets, the acolescent 
there's 12 species there, acolescent species. So these are the ones that do not have a upright stem. So the next most logical way to deal with them is to split them into two groups based on flower color. And that's the other feature again that I mentioned that's in that table one, either white flowers or blue to violet flowers. But we can also see that the, the white flowered ones tend to have flowers that are a little bit on average smaller, seven to 12 millimeters long versus the blue ones, 13 to 22. There is some overlap, of course. And oh, by the way, when you see these length measurements like this or any kind of measurement like this, it has this range, that's the normal range right there. And then if you see numbers in parentheses, both below and above, that means that this is sort of like the, the lowest extreme that could be seen, but it's, it's not within sort of the normal range of seven to 12. So they can be as small as five or can be as large as 14, but seven to 12 is where, they, where most of them are gonna be. And the same thing over here. Uh, over here, these leaves are never going to be lobed. Never any lobing on these leaves. Over here, you could go either way. Some species are more, this plus minus means more or less. Some species more or less deeply lobed, others are not lobed at all. So we've got four species that fit here with the white, eight species that fit here with the blue. We're going to start with these white ones here and uh, split off one of those right away. It splits off real easily based upon the shape of those leaves, those unlobed leaves. Now, this first characteristic describes sort of the base of the leaf. The leaf blades taper down to the petiole. So the blade is just tapering very gradually down to the petiole. And it may be even hard to recognize a, a petiole. And then the second part after the comma here is the overall shape of those leaf blades, narrowly elliptic to lanceolate. That's, of course, phyllolanceolata. And that's what this one looks like here. It's very easy to identify these very sort of, you might say non-typical violet leaves. We're used to the heart-shaped, more or less spherical or heart-shaped leaves of many violets. Well, these do not look like that at all. Very uh, elongate and lanceolate in their shape. So that's, that's gonna split off viola lanceolata from the other three. The other three now, again, so the first part is again, describing how the leaf blade tapers down to the petiole. The leaf blades at the base are more chordate, meaning they have a heart-shaped base, or they're more truncate, meaning they're squared off at the base, or they're cuneate, means they have a wedge shape. Those are all different ways that the leaf kind of narrows down to the base. And then the second part, again, is the actual shape of the leaves. The shape of the leaves, lance ovate to reniform. Reniform means kidney shape. Basically, we're looking at something that's more or less roundish in, in this overall shape. Ovate means, of course, somewhat egg-shaped. So that's, uh, and lance ovate means a little bit longer than an egg, but uh, ovate to kidney shape basically is what we're talking about here. So very, very different shape than these lance-shaped leaves here. That's gonna be group C. And that is then this next group, <clears throat> which there's a whole lot of uh, keying going on on this page. So this is that group C now, the acolescent, Flowers white, the leaf blades are ovate to reniform. There's three species here. All three of these species are imperiled species in Iowa. And this is the key mainly from floor of Michigan. There's a lot in here. Um, these three species are gonna be the, uh, probably some of the hardest uh, species to distinguish, these white flowered sort of ovate to kidney shaped leaves species here. So the first thing it does here, it splits off this one called Maklowski E, Maklowski's violet. Um, basically we're looking at the blades, um, whether the, how much pubescence there is. So you see glabrous up there uh, versus 4B is often sparsely to densely pubescent for the other two. There's lots of things listed here, and that's because you, you will probably need to have lots of different options to look at. Um, crenulations, that means the crenate uh, aspect to the leaf margin. I'll show you a picture of that in just a little bit. 
Uh, I've not seen any of these species, these three species, of course, because they're imperiled in Iowa. And who knows even for sure if we have them left. Um, some of the recent sightings, I think, have been as maybe as late as 2010. So hopefully we still have them. But uh, so I can't speak from experience here uh, on seeing these myself. Um, leaf blades ovate versus leaf blades more ovate terreniform. Now, those are very similar. So again, you're going to see that um, there's a lot of overlap here. The other two species, Blanda and Renifolia, split off here underneath 4B based on whether they're strongly stoloniferous. Blanda would be that way. Oh, and by the way, Miklowski is also stolen, or is uh, uh, actually, I'm going to pull up this one here. So this, this is the, these four species, these white violets that we've been dealing with here, the acolescent white violets. This is how Flora of North America keys them out, basically. Again, I said this key appears based on Flora of Michigan. There's a lot more going on up here. There's, and this is probably more helpful if you actually had them in hand and you could work through this and look at them very closely and, and look at these characteristics and see you know, which one's fitting the best. If you wanna just sort of, what's the nuts and bolts of distinguishing these four species? This one from Flora of North America reduces it down just to some real basic things. So again, lanceolate is going to be those lanceolate or narrowly elliptic leaves. All the rest of them have ovate to broadly ovate reniform or orbiculate kinds of leaves. Then we can split off um, renifolia as not stoloniferous. And that's what it says right here as well, not stoloniferous. The stolons, of course, are little runners. You should be able to see those pretty easily. They're right on the surface of the ground. Sometimes they're just a little bit below the surface of the ground, but you know you could probably uh, find those if you're out in the field, certainly. This also tells you that if you're collecting uh, violets, you need to be looking for these. Uh, so not stoloniferous, all petals beardless. So beardless means there's no pubescence on the petals. That's the term that was developed for violets for some reason. Pubescence on the... Um, the inner surface of the, especially the lateral or lower petals. If there's pubescence there, then that's called bearded. If there's no pubescence, there is no hairiness, then it's beardless. So that's that's going to be renifolia. Whereas again, these two species are going to be soliniferous. And of course now here we go, bearded or beardless. So that's go either way there. And then Blanda separates out here by the lateral petals, usually beardless, whereas in Miklowski eye, the lateral petals are usually bearded, rarely beardless. So, I mean, again, this one is a little bit more simplistic uh, in terms of know what you're looking at. The, the, this one up here is more detailed. Um, these crenulations, uh, again, I'm not looked at this species, so, either of the any of these species so it's a little hard to figure out what they're talking about there unless you actually can see for yourself i think what they're talking about is this right here so the one on the left is makoski eye and then the one in the middle is blanda and this is renifolia over here this is one that's kidney this, this is called the kidney leaf violet and you can see the leaves are pretty reniform at least this one right here but Based on the floor of North America, that simplistic one, basically what we're seeing here is for Blanda, for example, the margins are serrate, leaf blade margins are serrate. For Renifolia, it doesn't really, it's not really clear because it's not used, but on this picture here, it looks like, um, if you look at these leaves, they have little serrations in them. These have little serrations in them. So serrations are little teeth like this. These are fairly larger serrations. These are smaller serrations. So this is called serrulate. But what we're seeing here is probably something in between these two. So uh, the leaf margins have these little teeth, basically, is the point in both of these species. Whereas in Mikowski, I apparently, according to the key, what I'm reading is it's more crenulate. So crenulate is more scalloped. 
where this is crenate and then this is crenulate. So this is crenate and this is crenulate, which means a diminutive of crenate. So smaller version of that basically is what we're seeing here. The, the crenations are smaller here than what they are here. But this is barely basically in just sort of a scallop look. Um, these little tiny bumps along the edge. And they're even more tiny right here. Supposedly that is what they're talking about with the crenulations in that key from floor of Michigan over here. It's hard to see in these pictures because you know, you're looking at something very small, you have to blow it up a little bit. If you can, you probably can do that on, on a PDF, but um, that's the best I can help you with these, these three species. Uh, these are probably going to be a challenge, but again, they're all pretty uncommon. There is some differences in habitat. If you look at table one, um, a couple of these are really more uh, like fin or bog species. I forget which ones now. Uh, I can look it up real quick. I think the um, Renifolia is uh, more of a northern forest, algipic talus slope. So this one over here, Renifolia is more of a algipic talus slope species. And um, Miklauskii is this one over here again. This one's more of a fen species or wet sands, bogs, sedge meadows, uh, that kind of habitat. And then the last one is, um, let's see, Blanda. Blanda is, that one's more of a forest species, just a mesic uh, floodplain forest kind of species. So yeah, there's some, some differences in the, in the environment that these species would be expected to be found in. All right, let's move on to group D. These are going to be the acolescent ones now, but these are the ones that have the blue or violet flowers. And there's uh, eight species now in this group. And these are the last eight species of the 18 and you can see that we're going to separate those nicely into two different groups of four species each. Uh, that first characteristic there. Um, based on the blades uh, and the presence of lobing or dissection on those blades. So the shape of the blade is affected by the lobing that's happening in, in the, on the leaf. So the ones on the right there, uh, they have either shallowly or deeply lobed or dissected leaves. They have lancelate segments um, that again, provide that lobing. Now in some species, some of that lobing may not be present on the very first leaves of spring. So again, that's one of the problems with the variation. Again, we talked about uh, some of the later leaves are going to be better uh, in terms of what they are going to be better to use in terms of, of identifying the species. Versus the other group over here, uh, they don't have any lobing at all. Uh, they might have a little bit of scalloped edge or that, that crenate margin, or they might have a little serration, so a little bit of teeth going on, but there's no uh, division of the leaf into a, a segment that we could call a lobe. So let's do the ones that are dissected into lobes first these four species here. So we're going to split off um, one here by Les Agitata um, from the others based upon that leaf blade shape being much, much longer than wide. The overall shape of the entire leaf. Now we're looking at the entire leaf. It's got lobing in it, but looking at the entire outline of that leaf. When you think about the shape of a leaf, if there's lobing in it, you have to kind of think about what the outline shape is. So if you were to draw an outline around the the um, from one lobe to the next and kind of connect the dots, that would be sort of the outline shape of that leaf. What we're saying here is this outline shape or blade shape is much, much longer than wide, somewhat elliptic, maybe a little bit triangular, uh, very much tapered towards the tip. The lobing only happens near the base versus over here, the leaf blade shape is slightly longer than wide not very much, maybe just a little bit, or it's actually wider than it is long. And so these leaves overall shape is gonna be much more ovate, roundish to kidney shape, 
their tips are more broadly rounded or blunt at the apex and uh, the lobes are not confined to near the base. So this one is Sagittata and here's a really good example of what we're talking about with that leaf. The lobing is right down here. These little lobes you see right down here to base. Those are the lobes we're talking about here. Here you can see the uh, sepals on the flower, the calyx, and little this little uh, lobe that comes off the base. Again, that's a good example of an oracle, a little ear-like appendage or ear-like flap that comes off the, the base. So Violus sagittata is pretty distinctive with these very long, uh, narrowly triangular leaves with these little lobes that come off the base. <clears throat> the other um, three species over here. So these again all have uh, a, a shape that's much different than this, more roundish, I guess you might say. Uh, we're gonna separate those into two species here. The leaf blades deeply dissected, ternately means um, into sort of threes often, dissected into groups of three, but a lot of deep dissection happening here into uniformly slender segments or lobes that are pretty narrow. This is two species in group E. This, this is the prairie violet and the birdfoot violet. That's what group E species are. They have those leaves that are very deeply and finely divided or di dissected into lobes. The other one then, the leaf blades are more shallowly to deeply lobe. The segments are not lobed again, like they are up here. Ternately means that again, they're lobed again at the end. <clears throat> and uh, the lobes are wider. These, these segments here, are one to three millimeters wide. The, the segments down here are usually at least more than three millimeters wide. And so that's, that's gonna take us to Viola palmata, that troublesome one. And here's pictures of Viola palmata. So here are some nice examples of some leaves, very much lobed, very deeply lobed, like it says up here, very, very deeply lobed. Um, but, you know, not very narrowly lobed. These lobes are pretty wide. Now here's a good picture again, uh, showing some leaves that, you know, the first leaves are not lobed at all. So that again goes back the first leaves may not be uh, lobed. Now I wanna point out this leaf right here. This is, I can't remember where I got this from. It's, uh, I think it was maybe in Missouri plants. Um, it's being described as an example of Viola palmata, but I question that because here is the problem with Viola palmata. Here is a voucher from the Midwest Consortium or Consortium of Midwest, Midwest Herbaria for a violet that was, it was actually collected down in Georgia, as you can see here. It was first identified as palmata, but then it was annotated first by Landon McKinney in 1986 as viola subsinuata. Uh, and then it was annotated again in 2009 uh, and equated to this hybrid. This hybrid Viola Bernardii. Viola, by, uh, Viola Bernardii is a recognized hybrid between Viola Petitifida and Viola Sororia, two very common violets. And we see this hybrid uh, very often in ecotone areas and places where you, know, you have prairie on one side and forest on another side, and you have both parent species available. And you get leaves then that are a mixture of Sororia and Petitifida. And there's several vouchers in, in the consortium of Midwest Herbaria that are identified as Bernardii. And that's what this one is right here. So to me, this that is looks very similar to this leaf right here. I would probably actually call that a hybrid and not pal palmata. But as again, uh, just as an example of how challenging uh, this can be with the hybrids causing us many problems. All right, so here's the two that, um, again, 
in group E right here that, that I said, you know, come up because they're very deeply and ternately dissected into more thin linear segments, so to speak. Yeah, that these are our, our birdfoot violet and our prairie violet, which you're probably familiar with. And this is the kind of, again, division into the more, much more narrow, deeply dissected lobes that we're talking about. Um, the difference between these two is not so much in their lobing, so to speak, but it's really a difference in the flowers. Yeah, can you identify them vegetatively with some practice, probably, and, and kind of also knowing where you are, I think would help. Um, the biggest difference, of course, is in the flowers and the way the corolla kind of presents itself, as it describes up here, the, the corolla of the birdfoot violet is sort of, looks like sort of flattened, like it was pushed up against a wall or something. The, 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 um, the petals here are all kind of in a single plane, uh, kind of perpendicular, you know, like, like a, um, a wall, if, if you will. That's that flattenness we're talking about there. And then the big thing, of course, is though that the stamens are exerted beyond the corolla throat. And you can see the orange anther sticking out the throat right here. There's also a difference in the stipules, the stipules uh, of pedata. So this would be a vegetative thing. The stipules are fused to the petiole for a ways in pedata. And over here in prairie violet, the stipules are not fused to the petiole. They're free from the petiole. But again, uh, the stamens are not protruding from the corolla throat here as they are here. Now, the challenge with the leaves here, here's a good example. These are, here's a picture of it flowering, of course, and you can see the leaves down here. And here's a, a bigger picture of the leaves in the spring. These are spring leaves. This picture down here shows the leaves at the end of the growing season into going into fall. And this picture here again shows a little bit of the variation. So these are more the spring leaves right here. And these are the leaves that you see later in the growing season in the late summer going into the fall. We can see them, this, this kind of leaf right here is what we're seeing right through here, these leaves. And then these leaves down here are like those right there. So it's kind of seeing both of those. The, the spring leaves are still there, but now it's grown some additional leaves later in the growing season, and they look much different than these leaves. That's a good example of acclimation right there. The, the thing that's important here is that there's going to be a difference in the water stress that the plant is experiencing from spring to late summer. You know, obviously in spring, there's not much water stress, and these leaves work really good at that point in time. Um, they these leaves that have a longer, more thin lobing and lot, a lot more perimeter around the lobes of these leaves, that's a feature that helps leaves be more uh, water, con more water co conservation minded, if you will. Uh, also makes them also more able to um, equilibrate their leaf temperatures with the atmosphere. And so they can dump heat if they were getting warm because they're in the sun, they can dump heat to the air more efficiently. They can be more efficiently convectively cooled uh, when they're like this than when they're like this. So again, part of the, the challenge here is the, uh, the acclimation that these plants do during the growing season to they change the leaves that they're forming to make the best leaf to fit the environment that they're currently in. We can see there's a little bit of a difference too in prairie violet. These are some early leaves right here and they're not as deeply lobed as the later leaves. All right, now the, the last four species here, the acolescent flowers blue, but the uh, blades are not lobed. There's four species again here. So we're gonna split them into, it works out to split them into two groups of two as well. Uh, the first one, the first split there is the um, leaves being mainly longer than wide. And this can be a kind of a difficult thing to look at. And a lot of times you have to look at several leaves to get sort of an overall vote, if you will. Um, what we're talking about is what we see right here in these separate leaves. This one is clearly that way, but this is an earlier leaf, so it's not showing that characteristic very well. And these look like they're probably right at the merge of certainly being slightly longer than they are wide. This one right here, probably not quite this one, but these two certainly are. This one right here is certainly longer than it is wide. 
So, you know, what you, what you can do if you have to measure these, just measure the length and then measure the greatest width and look at that ratio. The length to width ratio is going to be greater than one if the, if the leaf is longer than it is wide. That's going to be important here. So, again, the first two species that are coming out here, Missouriensis and Cuculata, both have that characteristic we see up here on the upper right where the leaf blades are distinctly longer than they are wide. Zuriensis, they're more narrowly triangular to evade triangular. Leaf base is more truncate, whereas in Cuculata, they're more broadly, uh, narrowly to broadly ovate or chordate. The leaves are more chordate, and that means that their base is more chordate. Remember, chordate means heart shaped. Um, what else here? Margins sub entire in the apical third. So uh, in the tip here, uh, they're almost completely smooth. Sub-entire means almost entire. Entire means there's no teeth or anything. It's, the margin is, is smooth. Otherwise, finely to coarsely tooth in the other part of the leaf. So the, down in this part right here, we can see the teeth right here. So that compared to this one over here where in Cuculata, the margins are finely toothed their entire length all the way around the entire leaf. Uh, so you'd be looking at, again, whether there's teeth out here in this apical third or not to separate these two. Um, Cuculata, I, I, I question as to whether if you look, I didn't show this on the map, but if you look at table one, uh, again, look at the, the geographical range in Iowa for Cuculata. Uh, there's only four, and this is coming off a of bone app, which again, I'm not quite sure what their source of information is, but it's coming off of bone up. There's only four locations for it. And if you look at the entire course distribution in North America, those all those populations are very far from the rest of the populations of this species. So I'm not even sure in the in the status box, I put a question mark as to whether it's even native or not. Um, it wasn't considered by the four of Iowa working group. Um, we didn't realize it had been um, mapped as being present in Iowa and four of North America and also in Bonap, so it wasn't covered. So both of these are going to have, again, slightly longer, somewhat longer than wide types of leaves. There's some fine differences in the leaf serration. Uh, also, oh, the big thing, though, I should almost forgot to mention is this last thing. The lateral petals in Missouriensis are bearded with uniformly slender hairs. You can see that right here. Whereas, and this is this would probably be the best thing to look at if you have flowers. The lateral petals in Cuculata are bearded with hairs that are sort of knob or club shaped. And you can see that very easy right here. These hairs down here have little tiny bumps at the tips of them, little club or knob shaped hairs. Should be very easy to see with a dissecting scope. So again, Bacuculata is probably not going to be found very often because it, I, I think Iowa is mainly outside of its range. All right, the last two, uh, and you see here I've I've put um, Cuculata back up here because it can actually key out with these two species, or it could key out with Missouriensis, depending upon how you look at the length to width ratio of those leaves. And so again, it's going to separate from Nephrophila and Sorori on the basis of those, those hairs that we talked about, uh, the lateral petals having those knob or club-shaped hairs, also the oracles on the um, uh, cuculata are very large. These are the oracles that again are on the sepals, little ear-like appendages that come off the bottom of the sepals. Very law, very large and conspicuous. Um, no other violet has oracles this large. So that would be another way to, that's another way to separate it from Missouriensis too. All right, so the last two, Nephrophila and Sororia are very difficult to tell apart. Um, there's somewhat of a habitat difference. Nephrophila is said to be much more in, you know, damp, uh, sort of boggy types of environments, really wet prairie types of environments. Sororia can be lots of different places though. So it doesn't always help so much. The thing you have to look at basically is the pubescence. 
And what they say is nephrophila is going to be much more glabrous. You can sometimes see a few hairs on the upper surface of the blades, maybe a little bit on the petioles versus uh, sororia is almost always pubescent to some extent, at least on the lower blade and on the petiole, also on the peduncle. So here's sororia. We can see lots of hairs on the peduncle right here. You can see them very easily there at that backlight. You can see hairs on the bottom surface of this blade down here. Uh, if you blow up some of these, make them a bit bigger, you, you should be able to see some hairs on these leaves as well. Um, so it, it can be um, a challenge sometimes because you, you will have, there can be examples of sororia that is somewhat glabrous, sort of a glabrous form. And again, this all goes back to acclimation, how much pubescence uh, present probably is somewhat due to that. So another thing you can look at though, I guess, if you can find them are the capsules of the Cleistogamous flowers. They're green and nephrophila and they're more um, flecked or modeled with purple and sororia. And if you have actually have seeds, I didn't put it up here for nephrophila, the seeds, if you have a capsule, you can look at the seeds and nephrophila, the seeds are olive black, pretty dark, and uh, in sororia, the seeds are brown. So that would be uh, maybe a more definitive way of separating them if you had, had capsules and seeds that you could use. All right, well, the last thing we're gonna talk about briefly, and you see a picture of the uh, nephrophila seeds right here. That's the sort of black, more blacker seed of, of nephrophila. I couldn't find a picture of seeds for sororia to compare it with. <clears throat> Three things basically for ecology, and I'll make it quick. We've got about 10 minutes or so. So violets are, are important um, group for having this dichotomy of, of approaches to reproduction, chasmogamous versus chastogamous flowers. Uh, of the 73 species of violet that's in North America, 60 are known to produce chastogamous flowers. Nine are known to not produce chastogamous flowers, and this, the other four uh, are not known for sure. So what we mean by chasmogamous flowers Chasmogamous flowers are all of these flowers that we've been looking at here. These nice, open, showy flowers that are clearly um, attracting insects and are um, going to have insect pollination happening there and, and cross pollination hope, uh, going on, for, most likely. Uh, so that's chasmogamous. Chastogamous flowers are flowers that do not open at all. They're much more reduced. Uh, they don't have the showy petals, they basically stay in a sort of a flower bud, the sepals stay closed, they never, never open up. So there's never any insect pollination happening in Cleistogamous flowers. So the Chasmogamous flowers are going to be there for outcrossing, for exchanging uh, genes with other individuals, hopefully uh, not related individuals though, but other individuals in the population to, to provide you know, greater genetic variation in the offspring. The typical uh, goal, of course, for sexual re reproduction is to achieve that. Self-pollination is going to be the approach that happens, of course, in these Cleistogamous flowers. You can see here at the base of this plant here, here's a Cleistogamous flower at the end of a long scape. And uh, this is actually Sororia, Violet Sororia, the common blue violet. And so these are much more difficult to find and, and you know, see, and they're somewhat hidden, of course. Sometimes they can actually be down in the leaf litter or actually in the soil a little bit. These look like they were actually down on soil ways because this is completely white. <clears throat> so what happens here, of course, is self-pollination. This is when, because those stamens are right next to the gynostegium, um, they can easily, the pollen can e easily come in contact with the stigma and self-pollination can occur. So in self-pollination, of course, what's happening is um, it's much, much, much less of an outbreeding kind of thing. Of course, it's inbreeding. It's inbreeding at the most extreme that it can possibly be. Now, self-pollination is not the same as vegetative reproduction, though. You know, lots of plants do vegetative re reproduction. We know um, by rhizomes and other various ways of vegetative reproduction that plants utilize. And they do that because vegetative reproduction can be a very efficient way of making more individuals and putting them out in the population. Usually they're not gonna be very far, of course, away from the parent plant. They are exact clones 
of the parent plant uh, when vegetative reproduction occurs. But you know, it's it's a it's a feature that can be useful because one way of looking at it is if a, if a plant is very successful, if it's enjoying great success, it's doing well in its environment, it's doing well in the population it's in, then it would make sense to make offspring that are very much like it, because that gives those offspring the same genetic background and, and genes that it, it has and is apparently uh, working well for it. So there's something to be said for making offspring that are very, very similar to you in terms of at least the short term their short-term success. Now, self-pollination, again, is not the, quite the same as vegetative reproduction because these seeds are not clones. Their self-pollination is sexual reproduction. It's, it's the same thing as outcrossing, except here the parents are both the same plant. The mother and the father are both the same plant. So obviously, again, it's inbreeding at the highest level, but there is a little bit of variation in those seeds that are produced, of course but not nearly as much in outcrossing. So this is a way to achieve sort of the same thing that happens in vegetative reproduction, making offspring that are like yourself, pretty much like yourself, because that seems to be a genotype that's having great success. But now with the benefit of being able to disperse those seeds and get those seeds further away from you, vegetative reproduction can never get those new plants very far away from you. They're connected to that parent plant. The other thing that Cleistogamous flowers are going to do is they're going to ensure that at least some seed production occurs because uh, self-pollination does not require the help of any pollinator. And we'll talk about pollinators here for just a bit. So the, the pollinators for violets uh, are, are many. They include bumblebees, honeybees, solitary bees, circuit flies, butterflies, skippers, hawk moths, regular moths, beetles, uh, thrips have actually been reported as uh, pollinating viola flowers, uh, so many. But you have to remember that just because you see an insect visiting a flower and you nectaring at it, or you know maybe even has some pollen on it, it's not 100% guarantee that it's an effective pollinator. Uh, probably most of the time they are, but you know, in order to prove it as an effective pollinator, you'd have to make sure that it goes to another plant and actually deposits that, deposits that pollen on the stigma and pollination actually does occur. So if something is amiss with you know, pollinator activity or pollinator weather, or um, at the time those cosmogamous flowers are out there, uh, cleistogamous flowers, which always come later in the growing season, they usually come towards the end of the uh, summer, towards the end of the growing season is when the cleistogamous flowers occur. That always is going to assure that there's at least some seed production. Another benefit perhaps then of cleistogamy. The other thing to mention here is herbivory and the importance of violets as larval food hosts. And I'm sure many of you know that uh, violets are the sole larval food source for about 30 species of fritillary butterflies. So they're very important for, for those butterfly species. And they're also the host plants for the mining bee, Andri, uh, Andrinia violet, which is a special pollinator, a specialist pollinator uh, common to the Eastern US. It only uses uh, violets for its larval food host. Finally, oh, and this map here, by the way, I just threw this in last minute. Uh, this is the number of violet species in total. I didn't separate native non-native out because it would have been too hard to do that but this is a total number of violet species in Iowa and again in the, the states that surround us and you kind of see a pattern here ecologically where um, violets are more diverse and more numerous than you know the further north and east we go generally violets like more music cool weather and you know they're less diverse going to the south and, and west lastly seed dispersal so autocory and myrmicory. In violets, those capsules uh, that we saw split open there, a couple of pictures, those, those capsules, those three valves of those capsules, are, they're pretty thick in the perennial species. They're a little bit thinner in the annual species. But those capsules, as, as they uh, dry, they get dry uh, as they're drying out, becoming ripe and the, the seeds are ready for dispersal. 
they will um, gradually contract as they're drying out. And as they're contracting, they that tends to squeeze the seeds out. And in several species, then they're actually are ejected. Autocory is a mechanism in which the seeds are ejected forcefully from the capsule. And so that happens in at least some species of, of violet. These seeds then are thrown at some distance, you know, not, not huge, of course, but thrown at some distance away from the parent plant and land on the ground. Others that don't have autocory, oh, by the way, the ones that have autocory, they tend to have um, capsules that are pointed more directly upward. Uh, they have erect peduncles that stand up more, and so they're up higher. That makes more sense then for getting further away from the plant. Capsules that more passively just open up and drop their seeds. They're not ejected from the capsules. They just passively release their seeds. They usually point downward. So there's a little bit of difference in the in the shape of the way the, the peduncle and capsules are or, or oriented, excuse me, in terms of which of those two approaches the plant uses. Either way, they seeds end up on the ground, some closer to the plant, some further away from the plant if they've been thrown out. And then the second approach for seed dispersal, of course, takes over and that's rumicory. Uh, um, let's see, 70% of violet species are known to have a outgrowth on the seed coat that's a nutritious um, little appendage full of uh, oils and fats and some sugars as well, sort of a balanced nutritional little parcel of food. And what it's called depends upon who you're reading. FNA calls them eliosomes. Uh, Flora of Nebraska calls them cronkles. Flora of Missouri um, calls them an arrow. Well, they're not an arrow. That's that's a complete mistake. An arrow is what you see in the in the U when you see a, a kind of a fleshy covering that grows off the seed coat that almost completely surrounds the seed. These don't surround the seed. These are just little appendages um, that appear on the seed coat in a particular spot, these little spots right here. And whether it's an eliosome or whether it's a cronkle, um, no, it doesn't matter too much. It's the same thing fundamentally, but the difference in these is what the origin of that nutritious tissue is, what part of the seed is actually the origin of that. That's, that's the difference between a liosome and a cronkle. And my understanding is the correct term for violets is caruncle. That's the correct term for what this little appendage is. But this is the appendage then that is very attractive to ants. Ants find these seeds and uh, you can probably locate these um, little caruncles or these nutritious little food packets using their se senses and pick up the seeds and carry them on their way back to wherever home is to the colony and extract or cut these eliosome or cut these cruncles, I should say. It's an eliosome if it's a different species like Dutchman's britches. Uh, cut these off and use them to feed their larvae because the food source is so rich, high proteins, high fats, oils, great food source. And they discard, just throw away the seed then. So what's happened of course is the seeds are getting moved around by ants and that's what Mermumbacori is. So that is the uh, secondary part of seed dispersal then. That's it, I believe. So we are just in time. Great timing. Hmm. So I guess if there's some questions, uh, maybe a little bit of time, but if not, uh, you can always send them to Lance or email me. Um, I think you covered it. There was a couple of people asked about the <clears throat> Clystogamus. What that meant? Oh, what it meant? No, yeah, I covered that yeah. problem pretty well, right? Yep. And then um, somebody asked, "Is polyploidy an issue?" Polyploidy comes into an issue when if hybridization is going to favor a new species, because when you think about a hybrid, is again in order for a hybrid to form, at least the two species have to be similar enough to have the same number of chromosomes. But still, you know there is this potential problem in meiosis occurring, uh, and you know being able to establish um, reproductive isolation in order for a species to become separate. 
from this hybridation, hybridization event it has to establish reproductive isolation from the other species, especially the two parent species. Because if it can still mate with those, it just gets, gets swamped out. It never really becomes its own species. And so polyploidization hybridization is a doubling of chromosomes or tripling of chromosomes. So you get a polyploidy level of chromosomes. And that's then, if that happens as an event in the hybrid, that's, that's a step on the way then to establishing reproductive isolation from its parent species. And that was, that's what would have to happen basically again for a hybrid to eventually evolve into a separate species. So yeah, poly polyploidy is important in order to make a hybrid a new species. I think that's it, but if anybody has any other questions, feel free to unmute right now if you want. Or send me an email. You know what my email address is probably. And um, yeah, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. If you don't know, uh, just a quick announcement for those of you in central Iowa, the, you probably heard about it, but just a reminder, if you haven't, the um, I, Iowa Prairie Network Winter Seminar is coming up here pretty soon on February 24th. Saturday, it'll be held at the Ames High School, the brand new Ames High School. We used to have meetings there a few years ago, and we had to leave because they tore the old one down and built a new one. So the brand new high school, really nice, big, spacious area. Um, silent auction, all the typical things, a full day of programming. I'll be doing a workshop there on identification of thistles, um, all native and non-native thistles in Iowa and some of their relatives, actually some of the other species that you don't think of as thistles, but they're in the same uh, group as thistles. Then there's, yeah, there's several other programs, of course. Um, on the, one, One's going to be on the sort of the climax stage of prairie succession and prairie communities. Oh, we're getting, we have a visitor coming from Kentucky to talk about Southeastern grasslands. He's a former Iowan who moved to Kentucky and coming back to Iowa to tell us about the Southeastern Grasslands Coalition and what grasslands and prairies and barrens look like down there. Yeah, it'd be fun. Hey, Tom, do you think you're going to um, try to have a John Casey and Cyperaceae um, workshop this oh, year? I got, I got that right here in a note to announce as well. There Excellent. is one scheduled July. Put this on your calendar. And I'll, I'm going to post something to the Iowa Native Plant Listserv um, probably tomorrow. There's a Cyperaceae and John Casey workshop. This is a, you know, this is in person, hands on, out in the field, dissecting scopes, uh, three day workshop. July 9 to 11, so 9, 10, and 11 of July. It will be held at Nehat Marsh. That's a visitor, uh, na it's a natural area and visitor center on the Mississippi River in Davenport, right on the Mississippi River. Um, there's probably 60 sedges that are present in Scott County where, da where Davenport is. Um, we'll be looking at all kinds of wetland sedges and, and rushes to sand prairie uh, sites as well. So the whole spectrum of, of moisture regimes at that workshop. That's a typical, one of my typical three-day plant ID workshops. Uh, a lot of focus on collecting uh, specimens in the field, of course, and then keying them using dissecting scopes to learn the morphology. You'll get a whole set of keys for all the Cyperaceae and Drunkaceae in Iowa. And, um, yeah, it'll be, it's always a lot of fun. Um, did you say you have a flyer ready? to? Oh, to there's out? a flyer that's ready. I'll, I'll put that on Iowa Native Plant List tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, the registration uh, is, I think it's $160 for the three days. And that includes lunches. We're going to feed you lunch as well as all the handouts, um, transportation to the field sites and all that kind of stuff. That sounds great. I think that's all we got. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have you. Thanks so much, Tom. You're welcome. Bye. Night, Elizabeth. <laughs>